and we're live. It's Monday, November 1st, 2021, 5.04 p.m. Eastern time in DC and New York and New Haven and... But only uh, those places. And, uh, and uh, yeah, I know those are all the same place or something. And then, um, and, then uh, and also um, we are not allowed to have fun anymore. Uh, but we are allowed to have an entire incredibly indulgent episode that is just about me bringing on two of my biggest, like, nerd friends to talk about Dune, the movie that um, my, I, I don't know why I'm doing this, because literally my entire life for the past uh, week and a half <clears throat> slash 14 years has been like filled with Dune references um, because of John. Um, did I ever tell you guys this? He was like elected to be the this class speaker for high school. Um, and I still to this day do not know how that happened. Um, not no like no offense to him. He's like a very smart, he's a very sweet guy. I love him. But like I don't know what they thought he was going to talk about. And <coughs> like got up and talked the entire time about Dune. Like, like, like he Just, gave his entire graduation that, speech about Dune. It, that and, is got to be the, the, that is such a powerful move. Yes. Um, I think it was basically around like fear is the mind killer. He maybe is listening and like might be logged on to the chat to like, to like correct me about these things. Uh, he, I have read Dune. He claims I have not read it because I don't remember it because as well as he does. So anyways, uh -huh. I will be the, like, the resident idiot here. Um, but I was really excited about the movie. I liked it a lot. Um, I am kind of, this is kind of perfect that we get to do this day after Halloween because Kristen and especially Julian are like two of the most epic Halloween errs that I've ever seen in my life. Julian, you and Tom Lee used to like spend like upwards of two months in your costumes. I feel like often. they would in often like uh, like involve electronics, many times contact lenses, sometimes full body makeup. I just feel like there was a level of commitment that you don't often see in adult men to Halloween. I don't I don't to interpret that as a compliment. I, you know, I love single you. adult men. <laughs> Um, but anyways, we're not allowed fun anymore. We are allowed, allowed to talk to Dune. Welcome, uh, welcome, Julian. Welcome, Kristen. Uh, it's great to have you guys on. Well, um, good to be on. Scott, what were you going to say? I just, I have to really confess at, at, on the, at the outset that the only thing I know about Dune was I saw the recent incarnation, but I didn't see the first, I didn't see the first the, have the, you read the, the book? book? Nor have I read the book. So, oh, wow. I so but I did I just did see the movie, um, the most recent one. So I'm I I may not have much to to. Um, I um I actually kind of think it would be amazing to find someone to talk to have Scott tell us what Dune is about, having only watched the second. <laughs> yeah. <movie. laughs> like. like well, do you guys think that that would be like mildly entertaining and then we can like kind of riff? Um, I'm just kind of, I think it would be like, I just think it would be kind of like a very fun, Scott, like, um, yeah. Yeah, I'm actually so, curious uh, to hear that. I know. Wouldn't that be kind of fun? Wait, wait a second. Is this a trick question? I mean, no, no. It like a, I, it was like a movie I, about, about <laughs> like, it was like it was like Game of Thrones, but the but instead of dragons, there were worms. That's what I thought. Huh. It just it, it just seemed like Game of Thrones to me. Um, That's for, yeah, Game See, of Thrones. It's fascinating. It's fascinating to me that that came across because I remember my my kind of first thought as the credits rolled was, well, this was a gorgeous sort of illustration for the book. In the sense that you know you you might have a, like a nice hardcover with illustrated plates, um, and so I kind of enjoyed it in that, you know, in in that spirit. Um, but I thought, but gosh, you know, it really um, it just has to leave out so much. It's it it 
you know, so much of the story isn't isn't really there. Um, and I sort of wondered, A, would it be intelligible at all? But also I thought, gosh, and they left out all the interesting kind of Game of thrones political machinations that are a lot of what is sort of fun about that book. Um, it is a, it is a, you know, very, I, I, having, having actually read the first one again within the last couple Recently, of years. Yeah. Um, and then I just, just, you know, last night started kind of uh, skimming through it uh, again. Um, it's sort of striking that it really is like the first 150 pages of that book are, exposition um often rather clunkily delivered i mean it's it's um it is <laughs> it's kind of impressive that you kind of go this is a book with a lot of sort of flaws to it that if the world were not so compelling it would kind of otherwise be lethal um but it is compulsively readable anyway i agree with that i mean um yeah, I don't know how to, I was very surprised that I thought that the movie was so good on its own. I will also say that after reading the book. The reason David Lynch's movie, Scott, is like so kind of like, gets kind of, which was like the early kind of very psychedelic version of Dune that's like made fun of a lot is because the book is kind of psychedelic. It, the book reads mm -hmm. like all, there is <clears throat> so much internal monologue and actually, frankly, like, ESP type monologue, but like dialogue between characters that's not happening in intelligible ways that matches spoken dialogue. That like I was always kind of like, how on earth would you make that make any sense? And they did kind of a nice job, I thought, with the language and like the internal dialogue and things like that in the book. But I was amazed. Yes, I think that I think that what you said, Kristen. What did you think? You know, it was, uh, I had to kind of remind myself when I was walking out of the theater, um, like why the spice mattered, um, mm. which is something that's kind of completely left off. Like it sort of runs the spaceships and it's an important commodity, but like there's this giant backstory that you read over the course of, I don't know, I think the first 200 pages, 100 to 200 pages, and then periodically over the, I think the rest of the books about the Butlerian Jihad. And this whole other science fiction saga um, that happens something like 8,000 years before the period of this film, Dune. Um, Scott, this is going to be all, this is going to blow your mind. There's like this huge war between mankind and artificial intelligence. And as a result of, you know, spoiler alert, they stop using computers. Um, so you don't have like neural networks or even I guess just you know Microsoft uh, surfaces in, in the in the future world of Dune, all that stuff is done by kind of wetware computing using um, this uh, drug spice, which enhances uh, I guess your 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 math. Um, so it's like <laughs> the whole um, film is like is it's like a sci-fi epic that's like built on the back of this unstated other version of a sci-fi epic about like man versus machines, it's which is like a wacky thing for a novelist to try to do. In a way, it's like um, the Odyssey, right? The Odyssey kind of is constantly referring to an event that it doesn't- Wait, there's actually... another event in the-, yeah, the Well, the Trojan War, the, oh, the, the, event, the, yeah. the Iliad. So like there's, you know, when if you just read the Odyssey, you don't know that there's a whole like previous like story about the Trojan War. That there's a and prequel. That, yeah, there's a prequel, but but like a like a, a like a whole an epic prequel, right? That is a, a, the truly an epic thing. And this is what I, I guess that's what you're suggesting about Spice, right? Is that it's kind of alluding to this whole other story. You, uh, but like, right. Guys... The, the, the reason it's important is just not put in the film. There is there is there's like a, a one sentence where in one of there the, is one, one sentence of, in the film. One of his film strips, they say, without the spice, interstellar travel would be impossible. Um, yes. but they don't really explain yeah. why or or how that works or and they don't um, they don't explain why there are no computers or why their eyes are blue or why like or that like there is like. Uh, that it affects your mind. Like they don't explain that at all. They don't explain that it has a drug-like effect to people that are not used to like being on it and that it has the long-term effect of like 
the natives of Dune, the reason their eyes are blue is like the consuming the spice all the time in the air has like basically has this effect of like rendering like yeah. like can, it like can, changes your can, eyes. Like that's one can, like way you know someone is definitely from Dune or not. Or Rackman, just, sorry. Just, just suggest though that the, like this, the movie, like when I said Game of Thrones, I also meant in terms of style. That is like this movie didn't read as a movie. It read as like a pilot or an episode. And so therefore a lot of the stuff that didn't make sense, kind of like you're in a, mo in a movie, you expect things to be self-contained. If you think of them as episodes, like it, 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 it's fine that certain things aren't explained because you, you expect that they will be explained. And so I felt like that, that, that kind of lack of explanation made sense given the format. You know, one of the things I thought was really nice is that some of um, the movie was good in that some of the things that weren't explained didn't really feel like they require an explanation. Like the um, fact that everyone's using swords. Like, that's kind of weird. In the future space, we're all supposed to be using laser guns at each other. But instead, um, those don't work because of this kind of, uh, what are they called? Holtzman field generators, which is like dune tech that means that we don't use lasers. It's a swords and sandals kind of fable. Um, but like, it was so beautifully rendered that, uh, it, I thought it they did a great job with those with the blue and the red. I thought it was like brilliant. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. It was like, great. That it, was it like just... when, remember Scott, like when they hit the thing, when they like turn on their field generator and they're like fighting and then they're flashing blue and red in the fighting. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. Certainly yeah. improving over, over the, the Lynch version where everyone looks <laughs> like, uh, like, like a Minecraft character. As exactly. I, in the, uh, they, I, I have to say, I couldn't really understand what that was. I assumed it was some kind of force field shield. Yeah, yeah you got but it. Like that's, there was but not that's a whole like, lot more than that to get. Okay. Like I, <laughs> yeah, you didn't, you, there's no reason. So that's kind of why I was like, it would be fascinat fascinating to like know what Scott thought the movie was about. <laughs> like, oh. like, what would you be thinking that red and that blue was? Like, I mean, I think it's kind of obvious that it's some type of like, it's coding for either, I think it, the, the meaning of it seems like it's, to like an to to like a naive eye is like that it's coding as like either a force field or some type of like sense like it's it's like like a like a it like displays hits or like a health sensor or something does that make yeah, sense right. like it's like it's yeah, like yeah, right. right like i'm like oh he took one hit and like it's like, <laughs> it's like you know like it's like all of a sudden it's red and then it like blinks black to blue and like you know like and so i just but i like so I just like, but to your point, like who the hell writes a two or who does, who has like, maybe this is like the changing movies, like totally so that they're going to just always be serial like TV, but like a 240 minute or sorry, two hours and 40 minute pilot <laughs> like about yeah, uh, it, Dune that doesn't even do that much exposition about any of these things. Like what's the next episode or next like I mean, movie I, gonna I, look like I, I think it is radically underrated the extent to which the sort of possibility space of pop culture has been transformed by Wikipedia. Um I mean you think about something like the Marvel Cinematic Universe, yeah, you know, a lot of people have seen uh, you know, you go and see all of them and so they get to Avengers and or you know, or Endgame or whatever it is, and they, you know, hey, I've seen all these so I can follow what's going on, but um, you know, that's not everyone. Um, I think, you know, these, these are, and just, you know, the kind of the binge TV stuff. I mean, even, yeah, in theory, you can watch it all, but all right, I watched, you know, a couple seasons of this ongoing story and now I want to, uh, pick up again, the, the ability to do these kind of complex, really extended, really interconnected narratives, right? Partly it's, yes, you can get anything on demand so you can brush up and watch the backstory or whatever. Um, but I think to a significant extent, um, this stuff works because, um, you know, you can get on the wiki and remind yourself who all these people are and of uh, the plot point from the, the, the one you didn't see. And, oh, you know, who is this guy in the comics? I mean, I think about the kind of the way uh, WandaVision, and sorry, I'm getting a little off tune here, right, was playing in a really interesting way with the expectation that the audience is doing this kind of puzzling. Um, like, in the in the uh, spoilers for WandaVision, apologies, but like in the 
I think I don't, I've never watched it, so please explain what you're talking about. <laughs> in, in, in the penultimate episode, the characters been on the show, um, and you've been suspicious. And everyone who kind of knew the comics is like, oh, is this character actually the witch Agatha Harkness? Um, you know, she's Agnes in the show, but everyone who knows the the Scarlet Witch comics is like, oh, this this really seems like maybe it's Agatha Harkness, the witch. And then there's this kind of reveal mm -hmm. moment, right? where she goes, the name's Agatha Harkness, and it's like kind of a beat, like that's supposed to mean something. And of course, in, like internal to the text of that show, it means nothing. But if you've been following online for however many months, and you know that there's speculation about that, you go, aha, it is. Um, there's even actually one very early in that series, like episode three or four, where uh, Monica Rambeau, um, is you know, a fascinating shot where they... Um, She's having a kind of like a shot reverse shot dialogue. Um, where she's just come back from being like snapped away by Thanos, comes back. Her mother has died in the interim, um, who is a character in the Captain Marvel movie. And she's going back and forth, shot reverse shot. Um, no, no, I, I, you know, I just fell asleep. My mother was fine. She was coming out of surgery. What do you mean she's dead? And then she turns. And it's the only time they break out of the shot reverse shot. She turns to the desk nurse, but really to camera. And she says, my mother's name is Monica Rambeau. Look her up. Which is kind of like, I mean, she's, they're, they're basically, it's very cheeky, right? What they're doing is like, hey, if you didn't see Captain Marvel or you don't remember it, go to Wikipedia and look up Maria Rambeau. Because oh, we're not going to okay. explain who so this So you're kind of describing, was. you're describing like the role of the writing and the sequencing and signaling to the audience, like Easter eggs or to the Reddit crew of like things to go and look up or like things to go down wormholes are, or like references right. or like places to seek out more plot line and more story. The, yeah. I'm saying the, the show, the show kind of assumes, and again, sorry, I veered off from doing here, but like the show clearly kind of assumes the wiki and also sort of assumes the online culture around media as it's coming out, right? I mean, they do this sort of playful thing where the um, the FBI trying to watch this show is clearly kind of doing a version of what online fans do, trying to puzzle out the mystery. Um, so it's it's right. It, it's, it's a show that is made very consciously, right, um, to work in a sort of social context where, A, you have Wikipedia and you can look all this stuff up. And so they can throw in characters that, you know, showed up in a movie and maybe you don't remember. Um, but also, um, you know, they're kind of assuming they can they can do this sort of playful stuff with the online kind of fan community that's trying to puzzle through this stuff. Anyway, there's a very long winded way of saying um, I think you know this is like a good moment for Dune. Um, maybe it would be better as as a, a you know a kind of extended series. Um, but I feel like they you know this is a movie that's made kind of on the premise that you will find this really pretty, and then you're going to go and look up what the hell all this stuff means and what's going on. Well, you know, to that point, Julian, that actually happens in the movie where Paul is like kind of browsing Wikipedia to right. learn about a rocket. The sand like, worms are 400 meters. Yeah, 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 right, right, right. Um, <laughs> and I assume we'll get like, you know, more of that because, well, you know, I mean, I think what makes Dune so rich and important to readers is that it has like this very detailed, very textual history the, the the narrator and the characters are kind of constantly mining as like pretext for their actions, as lore, as prophecy. And some of that stuff just needs to be stated so that like Scott can, you know, kind of get the fuller meaning out of the out of the, the film. But, yeah, I don't know if it's on Scott. <laughs> no, no, no. But I, I, I can I just say what's so interesting here is to see to to see two different kinds of engagement with the movie, okay? The fans are engaging in it in one way, and you're assuming that other people are also engaging in that way, and they're not. So, like, for me, like, I really like movies like this, and I, I mean, I, I, like, I, I like action films. I like these kind of Game of Thrones-y kind of things. I like, you know, I, I'm... Oh, uh, uh, like this on the on the Star Wars films, but I these these are I like these kinds of films, but I'm not any more curious about it. Like then I, I just saw it. It was like a cool movie, and then I'll see an, I'll see another. You know, when the next installment comes out, I'll watch it, but not because it's like I've 
become a fan. I kind of think that this is, and like the audience is like, please, ex- or sorry, are like our loyal, lovely. We call them the 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 Greek chorus uh, uh, on the chat. I was like over there asking, like, please explain um, the like maybe a little bit more of what you're talking about. So, like, can we give some context of like what the book kind of like really briefly, like if we can, like of what like first of all what the plot line of the book is in like the most the most anodyne kind of like, like really like what happens and like type of thing and not all of the meta stuff and then kind of explain like what it means and why it's like a cultural touchstone for so many people. Kristen, I feel like you would be very good at this. Well, I'll try to do it in like, in like a non spoilery way because we are only really talking about part one of of the movie. So the first thing I would say is that it really kind of does line up um, with about half of uh, the book. And um, it's a story that starts with a kind of uh, a political um, shenanigan. Um, you have the rising house uh, Atreides, um, who is gaining um, seemingly uh, politically within the galactic empire and represents um, a threat to um, uh, Emperor Shaddam IV or whatever uh, his name is. Um, and so, uh, you know, as a, as a result, the emperor decides that he's going to, to sabotage this house. And he takes a contract that belongs to a rival house, the House Harkonnen, a contract that is very valuable and extremely lucrative. It's kind of the, the like central like defense shipping transit infrastructure, um, you know, uh, uh, account for basically all of the, the galaxy and gives it to House Atreides knowing that this will put uh, a target immediately um, on his back and and um, make the Harkonnens come after him. Make the Harkonnens come, come after them. He also, you know, the emperor also takes steps to, to further the Harkonnens development. At the center of the Atreides story, you have um, Duke Leto and his son, um, Paul. Uh, Paul is, um, you know, the, the young prince of this powerful galactic house. He is also the son of um, a uh, Bene Gesserit witch, which is uh, the, the kind of Dune version of, uh, of a sort of, of Jedi figure. Um, and his being a son is very significant because Bene Gesserit have this kind of eugenic breeding program where they've been uh, only selectively breeding, you know, for, 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 for many, many, many decades. Um, and they don't really allow men to come forward as part of this breeding program. So he's significant um, as uh, the, that the, she the let of... him be born and be be right. let him be born and be trained in the ways mm-hmm. of the Ben and Jesuit as a male is like right. highly significant. It's, highly it's, significant. it's not that it's not that they never allow men. It's that they wanted an Atreides daughter to be married to Fade Routh the Harkonnen. Mm. Okay, yes, and there's also that. Right. The, the, there's like some marriage uh, stuff, but yeah, yeah. So, he, so... He, he's there for by this by this act of insolence on behalf of Jessica, he becomes um, a very significant figure among the Bene Gesserit. He's a significant figure for House Atreides. He's also greeted as a, you know, a potential Messiah figure among the Fremen who are um, kind of the native um, uh, the population. The Bedouins of the planet. That's of. right. You know, which is, it, it, Dune is supposed to kind of exist within this Middle Eastern, North African, context the religion is derived from islam uh much of the language is de- derived from arabic and the kind of cultural traditions are are bedouin in in practice and all of that is kind of sort of indirectly uh there in tune. and i don't i don't think that it had even uh maybe any middle eastern actors but um uh that's the kind of like third part of the partition of paul uh he's he's kind of a, a, a hero among these three different faiths. Yep. And they, they show up on Arrakis and craziness pursues and assassinations and running away. And there's all of this kind of like, you know, the other key thing is that like the spice, which is we mentioned before is like this kind of this, um, this is like, is all over Arrakis. It's like in the sand. 
if Arrakis, which is a mostly like a, a just a dune, like it's just a sand based place where water is like the most precious resource and spice proliferates, but the rest of the galaxy has plenty of water uh, and needs spice and dune is only like it's full of spice and has no water. And so there's kind of like a reverse kind of trading of commodities there. And then like, uh, or interesting kind of part of like how the commodity resource network kind of gets set up. And then like, just how you survive in this type of raw environment. And like that the spice is both a dr as, like a psycho, psycho, like drug, um, like a, an LSD type drug to like to, to people who are unaccustomed to it. And that it like powers the universe. So like, I mean, and then there's like worms, which like are a whole other worms. thing. Yeah, worms. Like, yeah, I just, um, did you like the worm, Scott? So I I just found it um, impossible to understand how gigantism could evolve um, given so, such a resource pu poor environment. Well, cause they, well, I don't know. Am I spoil, I'm about to spoil something. But if I went out, I'll so, not so, it. <laughs> so I so, so so number one, I I didn't um I that that just struck me as odd. And number two, I um they seemed too big, like they were too like they were they, they, they just were too big. It was too you couldn't. It was very hard to like think of it as like some as a person, like as. I don't know. I it, it, they it were really quite did, huge. Yeah. Yeah. It kind of de I, when I thought of worms, I did not think that scale. Okay. But. I actually okay. Well, fair. But then I mean, what is the Kevin Bacon movie that like? Tremors. Footloose. Tremors. Tremors. <laughs> <laughs> or Foot Footloose is the one about the hero. Tremors yeah. is the one about the worm. <laughs> Yeah, uh, no, but I will say that there is like, that there, yeah, there's like eight Kevin Bacon movies that all could just become part. If you could like cut them up, they would actually be a version of Dune that would be completely palatable. Um, but there's Paul, some... Paul, you are the future of House Atreides, but I want to dance. <laughs> <laughs> Wouldn't I mean, it'd be pretty, it'd be pretty good. Anyway, yeah, I would totally, well, watch I, I'd totally watch that. Yeah, that would be like amazing. Like the six degrees of Dune and Kevin Bacon. Um, sorry, Kristen is nope. like, we're like hurting Kristen's heart right now. <laughs> Nobody puts the Maldive in a corner. Oh my God. Um, so I just think that there's, okay. I just think that uh, the, the worms were kind of large, but I don't really have a sense. I always think the scale is fucked up in movies, though. Like, I always think that, like, things seem like, you know, they'd, like, zoom out from, like, the Death Star. And I'd be like, whoa, that thing really is as big as a planet. Like, or, you know, you know, like, but uh, I don't know. Like, it looked like, a, you know, one spaceship. And now it's like, oh, look, there is one spaceship flying away from a planet type of, like, thing. And you get the sense of scale. And I think that it's, some, I don't know. What did you guys think? Too big? Like, does it really matter? That's gonna change a million times. I, mean, anyway. I, I, I thought they looked great. Uh, uh, the the that sort of multi tiered lamprey mouth with the uh, uh, the sort of countless needle teeth uh, was just a fantastic look. I thought they looked cooler than the um, the the Lynch version. Um, but I don't know if I have any deep thoughts about that fact. Great worms, great worms. Yeah. A plus Best worms. worms I've seen all year. Reminds me of a joke that, uh, that, uh, you know, that old joke, like, who's we got worms? Sorry. Anyway, <laughs> no, never, no one ever heard that joke. Say like, when you say like, like, we're going to go do this. And you turn to the person and you say, who's we got oh, worms? Right. Okay. Right. Sorry. Anyway, I I'll just like, take myself away now. <laughs> Kristen just left. <laughs> wow. <laughs> I that know. I have, I have never seen somebody react that badly to a bad joke. To one of our like, jokes. <laughs> that was that was such, like he must have such a refined sense of humor. I know, <laughs> true. Um, but um, 
I guess, okay, so I know that everyone's kind of, I told you that this episode was going to be self-indulgent. We weren't going to do a ton of explaining and we're just kind of going to get into it. But like, overall, like, Scott, would you see it again? Oh, yeah, I actually would. I, I would definitely watch it again. I've also watched Game of Thrones um, uh, more than once. Um, uh, and I, te- so I, 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 I like to rewatch uh, movies and especially kind of epic things where I don't understand everything the first time. Did you? Yeah, I, I think that. Well, that's interesting. Would you guys? Are you guys? Well, Kristen, you have you seen it more than once now? I have. I was actually fortunate enough to see it a month before anyone else saw it. I was in Paris, and oh, yeah. um, it was showing. I had a nice rainy day. I went to like a megaplex in in downtown Paris and and, and watched it. Um, and then I saw it with um, some friends when when my American friends could could see it as well. Cool. What about you, Julian? You see it again? Uh, I, I yeah, I'd see it again. I mean, I, I, if anything else, I'll, if nothing else, I'll probably watch it again before the. Uh... Uh, you know, the next, the second version comes, or the second one comes out um, just to refresh yourself. But yeah, no, I mean, it's gorgeous. It seems like, uh, frankly, it's, uh, I think, I think uh, I'm scheming to uh, get a bunch of people together to play the Dune board game uh, and, uh, and throw the film on in the background. So, um, so I want to at least half I want to do that. Background. Is the Dune board game any good? Uh, you know, I don't think I've, uh, I've played this version of it yet. Um, so I don't know, but by reputation, Kristen's yes. saying it's not good. No, 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 no. I, I'm saying I haven't played it either yet. I haven't, and I'm. I'll just get over to Julian. I, I, I played. I, I, I played a, a an older kind of version of it with slightly different rules. Um, that was sort of okay. Um, but I am I am assured that this uh, this version is uh, more uh, uh, more interesting. Can I can I ask uh, uh, um, you three? Not, not only um, knowledgeable fans, but also seem to be people of excellent judgment. Um, would you recommend that I see the David Lynch? That is version? a great question. Uh, it's it is a, it is a beautiful mess. Um, it is right, but uh, you, would you would you recommend it in the sense that mm, I'm not sure. <laughs> I'm not sure. I can. I can. In good conscience, recommend. Uh, it is a movie. I, I, it is very pretty. I would recommend um, having it on in the background with the volume down and looking at it occasionally. Whoa, that's a rousing. <laughs> that sounds like some Rotten Tomatoes, Kristen. Yeah, it's definitely the kind of film for when you like get a terrible cold, and you're gonna plan to fall asleep while you're watching something horizontally <laughs> on the couch. This is like a top tier. Sick day candidate. That's, um, that's just some it is functional, worth it for functional just like recommendations. <laughs> very, very specific scenes kind of are, are worth watching. The the fear is the mind kill the, the litany against fear scene where um she's doing the gum jabar with with uh with Paul uh and, and the and the pain box. Um and just the stuff Har- Harkonnen just absolutely chewing the scenery. And uh, and like Brad Dourif as his uh, as his ridiculously eyebrowed mentot um, are just kind of hilarious and fun to watch. Um, and the whole like just the whole, my Baron, you are so beautiful as he like drains his pustules um, are just kind it's of gross. wonderful don't, little don't, I'm iconic just moments. Simplify this for you. Just don't do this, Scott. Like just do, like don't like <laughs> unless you are like. Unless you are, it seems like to me, unless you are like near unconscious or missing sight in one eye, don't like bother putting on Dune. I would say David there, Lynch. There, 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 are, there, like, there are half a dozen better David Lynch movies that I would, I, you know, I, I would I am, urge you to watch first. I take this to be the, the form of the recommendation. If you get COVID, you could, you could watch it. Definitely. <laughs> That's the, <laughs> that, that that we would call that a hypothetical imperative um in the in the moral philosophy business um but, michael um, mckenna hello Hi. 
Hello, how I are love, you? I love the dor dorkiness of your question. So yes. please go ahead and ask it. Yes, how much, uh, how much does Star Wars owe to Dune and is that an actionable amount for the George Herbert? <laughs> I ask mm. this because when I first saw Star Wars, and the droids are climbing over the ridge and there's a giant skeleton in the background, I say, oh, this planet has sandworms. <laughs> Interesting. But yeah, I mean, I, 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 quite a bit, I mean, a fair amount. Uh, I mean, Tatooine is, is pretty clearly, oh, but two, Tatooine has two suns instead of two moons, but um, a lot of the aesthetic is, is, but you know, I mean, Star Wars is such a kind of pastiche of, old samurai movies and john ford movies and um so you know yeah dune dune is in the mix too um but i think it's you know it's one of those things where it's it's like such such uh sweeping uh, and diverse copyright infringement that no <laughs> no no single claimant can really uh uh you know can really get any purchase i'll i'll, I'll stand up for I'll stand up for Ralph McQuarrie here. And I'd say that I think his vision of kind of an entire galaxy stuck in like stagflation um, really sings out in Star Wars. Like everything just doesn't work. It's broken down. Like the market is depressed. It's all just kind of sunk. And that's not something that you see in Dune or even a lot of, um, I think, film sci-fi before Star Wars, just the sense that, there's like an economic logic to the universe too. In Dune, it's just like, you know, tremendous gleaming, uh, you know, it's all, it's it's incredible. It's just fantastic and that's great. But I really love Ralph McQuarrie's version where everything is kind of like, eh. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that kind of, I think that that is, um, I think that that's right. Um, Mateo has disappeared. But he asked, um, are you, he asks, and now I'm curious, are you guys James Bond fans? I mean. <laughs> I'm like I'll, interested I'll, I'll, in the I'll Venn diagram it. between people who really like Dune and people who are really enthusiastic about James Bond and Ian Fleming. I, you know, I enjoy a good James Bond movie probably as much as the next fellow, but um I don't know if I'd call myself like a an extraordinary fan. I haven't seen the new one yet. I will probably wait for it to come out on, you know, streaming before I before I, I watch. But I probably will watch it eventually. Yeah. <clears throat> Are you a James Bond fan, Scott? I I love action films, but I think James Bond films are always mediocre, um, and um, they are they are. They, they are a perpetual disappointment. Um, so if you, if you, if you go in with the, um, I don't expect anything from this, then it's enjoyable. But other than that, I find it, um, I find it, 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 it it's, it, it's, th th there's so much interesting things they could do. I have to say that the last couple have been, have been different and been a more, a, a Daniel Craig is just a much more complex um, actor and figure, but other than that, nah. Susan, nice to see you. Go ahead and ask your question. Yeah, thanks. Okay, so um, the basic, um, what was your favorite scene? So I get to learn something about, hmm you know, what was in the visual field and a little bit about the storyline and something about That's character. a great question. Yeah. That's a really good question. Yeah. Um, I thought that the photography was so, so amazing um, in, in this film. I think I could, I, I could like watch like a super clip of just um, people <laughs> going landing. through entrances, ships landing, yeah. That scene where, um, gosh, they, there's like a kind of like a, not a red carpet, but a green hexagonal carpet rollout on um, the Emperor's military planet where they go and see the Sardukar forces. Um, yeah, so something Secundus, yeah. yeah just any time there so was like a, a, a landing and a lot of diplomats filing out on the tarmac mm -hmm. um, was just tremendous stuff. Yeah, I was gonna say the the handoff when the you know, the, the imperial sort of uh, 
whenever uh, Harold arrives to, uh, I, I, I it's a sort of, I don't think it's even in the book. It's a kind of negligible narrative importance, but it's just really gorgeous. I, I, yeah. Uh, and, and then the, you know, the, 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 the mast ranks behind them start chanting Atreides. Um, I enjoyed a lot. Um, the seeing the 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 ornithopters take off for the first time, uh, I I enjoyed the hell out of. It. I think those are um, I thought really, the were really well done. Um, uh, I really liked. I have to say, I really liked the scene at the very end where we finally got to see someone riding the sandworm. Like even though it was like kind of just like out in the distance, but there was like, uh, I don't know. I'm like makes me excited for the next couple of movies. Um, I I, yeah. also, I enjoyed the the Brando homage with uh, right, still in Sarsgard, kind of coming up out of the. Um, was it <laughs> twice? Right, the the first time you see him, he's doing the like the Kurtz. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. And then kind yeah. of rising from the the goop uh, later. So I, I enjoyed those moments and just you know him floating. Nice call. Uh, and and again, sort of chewing the scenery. Um, substantially less than his predecessor from the Lynch version, but it's true. Um, but all the same, cool. There's cool some visuals. sweeping kind of desert scapes yeah. um, that made me think back to the um, to the earlier question about Star Wars, and um, and I was thinking, you know, actually Rogue One really does own a lot to to Dune. Rogue One has like kind of a, a story about like a, a religious. Um, uprising on a, a planet being like mined for its resources coming like so late as Rogue One did it seems like even more naked to tell a new story that goes back before Star Wars to rip up to but um, I liked um, I gotta find where they find those shots of the desert because it's just those gorgeous lunar moonscapes on earth are like stunning yeah, yeah. Scott what did you think I don't know. Uh, I, I like that. In, I mean, I, I have to say, everything that everyone just mentioned really was striking to me. Um, and it was um, bizarrely for a desert movie, it was very lush. Um, and, um, and like, I, 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 I agree the choreography of people, it was, it, it, they did private spaces. They did fight scenes well. I mean, there, it, was, it was really a, just a terrific job. So, like, if you had to name one, so like the movie stands for a lot of different things. I think, uh, and I like uh, Kristen. We kind of like gave the plot of like how we got to like of like the beginning of doing everything, but we didn't really get to like why it's so significant in the culture and like a lot of the themes that like make it so significant kind of made it such a huge deal and make it give it such a cult following and like why do you think what are the main themes that kind of come out of the book that like make it such a cult following um well i think that um uh you know i, I read a piece by um uh roxana hadidi in um vulture and it was about like herbert's frank herbert's you know use of islam and what he did well and what he didn't do well and what the movies did well and didn't do well and you know i thought her assessment was really smart and you know she you know kind of gives herbert a lot of credit for um mining islam for themes mining middle eastern and northern african for themes but in this um kind of reverent uh way like in a very detailed way and that i think was um you know, responsible for why it was, uh, you know, really grab people. Like it is like this big and very ornate uh, universe. It's um, a powerful bit of world building uh, yeah. with a lot of, you know, familiar details without I think veering off a very narrow course into Orientalism. Um, so I, I think that's kind of, you know, that to me, it seems like the, the, um, the, the, one of the reasons it just had the biggest reach that just kind of sweeping, um, desert landscape of a story. Yeah. What yeah. Do you I mean, think, I think, feeling... I think it's I, a, a big part of it, I think is the world building. It really feels, um, like a, a richly realized world with lots of stuff going on in the background. I think the kind of the complexity of the sort of the political machinations, I mean, the, the, 
Um, the kind of the standard comparison point for that is Game of Thrones now, but this is you know, decades before that. And I think this, it was, there's a, a level of uh, the sort of the complexity of the political intrigue um, that was unusual in uh, science fiction of, uh, of the era. Uh, maybe it's less extraordinary now. I think the, the vision of a really kind of human future in, the, in that, um, you know, there aren't computers, there aren't AIs, um, and the yeah. substitute for that is this vision of uh, a, a future where humanity has through, you know, some combination of eugenics and sort of intensive mental training um, brought out. You get the, so the Mentat and the Bene Gesserit are kind of weird gender divergent uh, versions of this. Most of the men, I think all the Mentat we see in the in the book and the movie are male. Um, the Bene Gesserit are, are explicitly sort of a female order um but they have both in varying ways sort of trained themselves to have these kind of extraordinary uh mental powers the mentat sort of computationally and the bene Gesserit, um i guess in terms of I mean, also computation in a sense but in terms of incredible sensitivity to um nuances of body language and vocal inflection i mean to the point where they can kind of harness this to command people by um, by sort of reading someone and then using the right vocal inflection. Um, the idea of ecology, I mean, this is, this is a, um, right, it's sort of a series where the planet is itself a kind of central character. And the, uh, I mean, there's this sort of well thought through picture of, well, not just how does the political intrigues among the humans um, play out, but um, what is their relationship to the ecosystem? Um, and that, of course, right, the sort of the appealing psychedelic. I mean, David uh, 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 Herbert really was, um, um, you know, into psychedelic mushrooms. And the, the right. blue of the psilocybin mushroom is where he got the blue of the um, the Fremen eyes. So I think, you know, certainly, especially in, in the kind of the context of the 60s, this uh, the ecological mindset, the very richly realized world, um, and the, the sort of psychedelic element and this, this is kind of aspirational version of um, the sort of outer frontiers of human potential um, are, are really sort of exciting, especially again, from the kind of the, the, the context of a, of a 60s, uh, 60s culture. That was like, that was a, those were both incredibly intellectual and academic answers. And I was literally basically thinking that you were going to, I was thinking, I was like, fear is the mind killer is like such a cool thing to say to like a 13 year old when you're also yeah, 13 also <laughs> like going like, or like i don't know that like there are just like the litany when you are like a scared kid like the the, the litany is like a very strong like i don't know it's like a very profound kind of zen and like you're right like not just zen but like not eastern but like in the sense of like kind of but a very um Sure. It is a very kind of accepting what you like, accepting your circumstances, and then like not letting the adrenaline control your reaction to them, uh, type of type of thing. And I thought that those were like, I kind of think one of the reasons that it was just such so powerful is all of the things that you guys listed. But like, it kind of had some great memes. Like it kind of has some good takeaways, right? It has like these giant sandworms. It has like the spice must flow. I mean, like really, it has some good lines. It has like the good black, lines. The black has the has the black the, the black box. The black oh, box. Pain. The pain box. Yeah, the pain box pain. is a great is a great meme. I mean, you know that that I I I. It's funny when I saw the movie, I was like, oh, that's where that meme's from. Um, yeah. Which is of course the way movies are meant to be experienced. <laughs> um. Yeah. I was so last question also from Mateo who had to go do homework apparently, but asks um, <laughs> whether you what you think explains the particular relationship between sci fi and nerd culture and why that genre inspires kind of a certain type of nerd and why not say, as he says, romance novels which I kind of think is like a fascinating place to end because maybe we'll do a movie night again and bring people on to talk about a new movie that's come out or maybe an old movie, but it's a good question. Like, why do we have such a rich, I also don't want to like confuse sci-fi and fantasy if someone like is going to like send me a real box of pain in the mail if I do that, um, like I'm very afraid. Uh, but what, I mean, what do you guys, uh, what do you guys think?
Like why, like why, I'm also kind of curious, like you don't have overlap into James Bond, which definitely has like one type of thing. And there's one type of nerd that does that. You do have overlap into Marvel, Star Trek, or Star Trek, Star Wars, but also Star Trek, right? Kristen, you watch Star Trek. <coughs> I watch a little Star Trek. I um I think it's 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 the same impulse that drives art, right? It's like a dissatisfaction with the with the existing world, but it seems like a different kind of funnel for the for creativity. Hmm. Um, uh, you know, um, I, I guess all art responds to that that kind of fundamental desire to look at a series of problems or estates or um, interactions and just question that and pose like a, a di different way of, of looking at those things. And, um, you know, science fiction is kind of the more orderly bound channel for that creative impulse. Um, like most good sci-fi really does have like, a, you know, a built world in which they invert or reverse or flip a couple of levers and and let the story flow from there and that is that is to me i think a very orderly way of looking at at the world um uh and and it's kind of a a, a, a logic game or like a, a series of logic games drives a lot of science fiction um and imagine you change one thing and what follows from that uh, and yeah, I think it's it's a lot of it is the enjoyment of the fruitfulness of playing out. Okay, uh, what if we change this? Uh, what is what does society look like if? Yeah, the, 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 cho the joys of counterfactual reasoning. Right, mm -hmm. but very creative. I mean, it's very different yeah, no, from of course. making an yeah. abstract painting, but I think it still derives from that fundamental need to to change the world around us. Yeah, to have something cohesive. I mean, this is like what you said, Kristen, about like the world building being so incredible, right? And like, it's one of the things that we all kind of drive people crazy. It at least drives me totally crazy. And Harry Potter um, is like the, uh, like, have you guys, sorry, John like loves reading Eliezer Yudikowski's like the rationale, like the rationale of rationality of harry potter or something it's like an alternative rational universe for harry potter in which like if you're allowed to like flash in and out of hogwarts magically then everyone can do it and not just one person because magically like they have like there's certain types of rules of the universe that appear in the first episode and then there are exceptions to them continuously and they don't make sense if you kind of like for instance if there were all of these ways to like operate into Hogwarts like why would not the evil people use them to get into Hogwarts and like these types of basic types of kind of inconsistencies um in the world I mean, the that one I world. think that's that's one of the, the the rare ones that I think the books at least explain there's some kind of warding system to prevent people from doing that but uh, uh but yeah uh, Harry Potter doesn't does not stand a whole lot of thinking about the details um yeah. of how anything works um, or how it interfaces with the real, the, like the real world. And um, I always thought it was very strange in the, I mean, it's sort of left in the background in the, the main Harry Potter books. And they did these sort of fantastic beast things where they sort of more explicitly kind of bump up the wizarding world to like this sort of impending World War II. Um, and you do start going, hey, why didn't all these wizards, you know, do anything about that? Um, <laughs> Yeah. Just, yeah. I don't know. Yeah. I mean, I think that that's, I think that that's right. But, um, Kristen, any last worlds about inter words about internally consistent worlds? Um, uh, you know, I, I wonder whether, um, you know, fans and casual viewers like, you know the the julians and the scots will um both appreciate the movie the same way by the end of the sequence as, as i understand he's going to do one more movie and that's the end of dune but it might be a trilogy and incorporate some of the material from the later sequels something like that but what you know by the time this movie is done like it would be 
you know, quite an incredible feat to satisfy like the, the true readers, the people who like have the Wikipedia open, could possibly edit it. Um, and the people who are there for, you know, great cinematography and a cool score and a good movie. Um, but like after episode one, I thought, I thought they were halfway there. It's a good question. And we keep making the Game of Thrones reference. And Scott, you said you watched that too. But did you like the end of Game of Thrones? Hated it. We don't know how Game I of mean, Thrones ends. I, I, it's just, it was, I, I was to say the biggest fail um, uh, of any thing. It's like the Hindenburg of, <laughs> of, 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 yeah. of, uh, of failures. Um, and uh, I started watching the beginning. I was, uh, and then, like I just couldn't even go anywhere near season seven. It, it was just really um, painful. Um, yeah. I will, yeah, I, I, I will, I will say that. We're, but, so I'm old enough to remember when um, the audience was thought not to have any memory from week to week. So all TV shows had to be self-contained because you uh -huh. couldn't assume that anybody, and so then what really changed was in the early 1980s, Hill Street Blues and certain shows like that introduced this idea of continuity that people would actually remember and there'd be an audience that would go week to week. And this was, this was incre incredible, like the kind of the order of, um, of uh, sophistication that you can have when you can actually cross-reference and things like that. And then I was just thinking about like, that's what's happening now with movies, right? Is that like the, the, the serial nature of them is becoming more and more obvious in the ways in which you used to think that movies needed to be self-contained, just like TV shows needed to be self-contained. But that feels like that's no longer the... Yeah. I don't know. I think that that's, I think it's a great point. I don't know. There's just some real, he, really huge changes mm. in the medium. And then I think it's also based around, and you can, you might know more about this, Kristen, but like, I think it's also based around like the ad models and things like that. Like, I think that there was like the idea of standalone episodes is the idea that you could constantly be bringing in new people. And if you left people behind, you weren't going to have new people that were brought in because you couldn't mm -hmm. replay. There were no reruns. Right. Like what's a rerun? Like, I don't know. Like, right. so there, well, so like the idea that you couldn't like catch up if you lost your place is like exactly why we now watch TV with Wikipedia open. Like, I mean, it's kind of like, right. Like you yeah. can just deepen your entire intellectual engagement with everything you're watching and like that's anything so you feel like that's you don't, so true. You don't, right. Like that's it's right. just, it's well, so the, much richer. I mean, oh, the, yes, model so used, the model used to be, look, there are basically three networks. There's a handful of other channels. There's three networks. Maybe you've got a dozen channels available total. Um, so if yep. people are flipping around, so you've got a gut TV. You have to, and, it's, and so there's a, a, limit, a fairly limited number of options. Um, and you want to make sure that if someone is flipping through the channels and stops here, um, they stay long enough to watch some ads. And you kind of you have to you have a satisficing goal right which is you don't want them to flip away but past that point you don't really care how much they like it you don't get any more ad revenue for them liking it more um so uh you know it just sort of has to be good enough to keep them there instead of flipping to one of the other you know eight or options like but also the entire plot, like, sorry, again, Kristen, you can talk about this more, but like the entire plot sequence of a 20 minute show that had to have like eight to nine minutes, of a 30 minute show that had like eight to nine minutes of commercials brought into it and had to have arcs that continually left people wanting to come back and not leave during a commercial break because they wanted to see what happened is like a really fantabulous yeah. like example of like, like the commercial medium dictating the message like in this very true way and so you just like have these like i mean they just don't exist anymore um my parents i remember were like at one point like i think we were watching like some they were flipping through it was like the 90s or the like the early 2000s and we we're watching something and there was some terrible really kind of bad reality tv show and my parents were like tv is such trash right now and i was taking like this class of brown on like the sopranos and i was like oh no 
like, what are you talking about? TV is so great right now. <laughs> like, and I mean, of course both are true, but like, um, yeah. Anyway, um, we're gonna leave it there. Thanks everyone for putting up with yep. my entire self-indulgent day, uh, Dune day. Um, and, and thank you all for ma for making me feel comfortable in in um, uh, in, in in your in your. I, I reckon that I I knew I was the outsider, but you didn't make me feel like one. Very true. You, you knew our ways as though you were born to them. <laughs> <laughs> Very good, excellent job. I was like really you like can, a bit. You can you can Venmo me that my, that setup. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, we will be back fifty six minutes. 23 hours and 56 minutes from now, 22 hours and 56 minutes from now with Oren Kerr. Um, and which I don't know what he's going to be talking about, but surely it will be spicy and involve <laughs> a blackboard. Um, Kristen, Julian, thank you again. It was thank great you. to see both of you. And um, until next time, Scott, what do we say? We can't have fun anymore, but we can have remakes of classics that can be enjoyed um, for generation, for new generations. That is so true. That's right. So true. Let's just keep remaking stuff.